that you'll be here as well. Firstly, I would like to apologise for being unable to be there in person today. Sadly, my own commitment has kept me from this fabulous window of this event at the Greens Network. I believe in a diverse business community, one where everyone stands equally, regardless of gender, colour, or religion, is a successful business community. I am fully committed to ensuring gender equality is fulfilled at Suffolk County Council. It isn't about creating undue advantage for women, but simply removing barriers to a level playing field, ensuring that women are free to develop their abilities and make choices without any restriction. I am delighted that the Women's Network plays such an important and influential role at the Council, and I look forward to being a part of it. The aim of the network is to inspire, support, and mentor women in the workplace, shape agendas, challenges unfair and discriminatory behaviour, but also meeting with other female business networks. It is also an ideal showcase to raise awareness of female success stories, whether these are personal or business achievement success stories, whether these are personal or business achievements. Today you will hear from life plan coach Wendy Smith. Wendy represented England at the 2004 Athens Paralympics and is an ambassador for the 21st century which enables children and people to find inspiration and happiness. Today she will talk about her personal development and self-management and how she helps people reach the next level of performance. I really hope you enjoyed today's event and I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. So first of all, can you all hear me okay at the back? Because we've got no microphones today. I did say because I'm a basketball coach, you can probably hear me because I'm used to shouting in large arenas at people. So what a nice message to start with as well. And it is actually a pleasure to be here somewhere nice and local to do a talk just before Christmas. So my purpose and intention for today is just to share a bit of my life experience with you. Maybe give you a few little tools and techniques for yourself, but mainly just to provoke a bit of thought within yourselves of what maybe you can do a little bit differently to get more out of your life or of those around you. Not just out there, but in here as well. So in, in work, how can you all work better as a team? Because I suppose team performance is one of my specialities. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of my brief history, because some of you may know me, you might have heard me before and some of you won't. So I grew up in a pub over in Essex called the Queen's Head. <coughs> Been in the family for years. My granddad had had it for 60 years, and my mum and dad then had it for another 30 years after my granddad. It was offered to me and my sister, but we looked at my parents and the stressful environment that they'd been in for their own careers. Now, for me, growing up, it was very interesting living in a pub because you didn't really see your parents for most of the day because they were working. My friends used to love it. They always wanted to come around and just spend time around mine. But I always wanted to go and spend time around theirs because their parents were about and they could never understand us. Now, my mum and dad, they did work a lot, but they did as much as they could with me and my sister as in like life experiences. So we grew up with a lot of resilience. My dad would take us out and he wanted boys, by the way. So me and my sister did everything that boys would do with their dads. And then my mum obviously tried to dress us in pretty little dresses when dad was trying to take us out doing the boy thing. So we had this, this weird... Weird relationship with both parents. One really wanted like males and one really wanted like females. So we grew up, like I say, with a lot of resilience. We had, we were very lucky as children. We had a lot of animals. So we were always given responsibility. And before school every day as well, primary school, we had to work. So we understood the value of money from a very early age. If we wanted something at the end of the week, we'd have to do jobs in the pub before we went to school. And that just became normal for me. So I considered myself a worker. Now, for me, in work as well, my dad was a test driver for a motor company before he had the pub. So me and my sister grew up around fast cars, motorbikes and lorries, which has led us both into certain environments. All the way through primary school, the only thing that interested me at school was sports. I could already read and write before I went to primary school because my mum made sure we could. So when I got into my first class, I remember at the age of five years old, and a teacher sat me down with an ABC book and said, we're going we're gonna to do reading today. I looked at the book, and I said, can I have a proper book to read, please? And she said, you'll do what everybody else is doing in the class. And so I, you know, I didn't know about those back chat teachers, so I just said, I know my ABCs, can I have a book to read? And then I was told I was being rude and not to be naughty. And this is basically where my schooling started. So what I learned very quickly, because I'm a very quick learner, if I misbehave,
behave in the class and kept saying that I wanted to read real books, I would get told off and sent out of the class to the library. Where there was a lovely lady <laughs> who would say to me, Go and choose a book you want to read with me. So I basically did all of my learning out of the class because my mum used to be an accountant. I did maths at home and my reading I did. I just used to say a few things to the teacher to annoy her slightly and I would get sent to the library and we'd have a lovely day. So I learned very quickly how to get my own way. I was like I say, quick learner. Sport, absolutely loved sport. And the only job I ever wanted to do by the age 11, of 11, I could strip a car engine down and rebuild it perfectly okay on my own. So I spent a lot of time under the bonnets of cars with my dad. So as far as I was concerned, I was going to be a car mechanic. I was going to have my own garage at some point. So I did not need an education. So you can imagine all the way through senior school, if the teachers weren't engaging me, it was very interesting because I was, a, I was what you call a problem child. Probably nowadays they would call me ADHD. So that would have been the label that I'd been given. Now I spend my life taking labels off of people. So when I meet children with ADHD, the nice thing is that I know that it's just a label that we've stamped on their head and there is something we can do about it. But I'll get to that later. So for me, all the way through school, sports. I was always inspired by, I don't know if some of you remember Daley Thompson. He was the gold medal decathlete. I think it was 80 and 84. He got two gold medals in the decathlete. <coughs> and that man just inspired me to try everything there was to do with sport. Some things I was terrible at, but most things I was really good at. One thing I really loved, though, was motorbikes. And that's what led me to the space that I'm now in. So I always had bikes ever since I was about five years old. And I couldn't wait until I got my first bike on the road at the age of 16. And I remember it very clearly. It's a little 50cc, little whiz up. And he used to bug along like that. And I had a friend who was a year older than me. And he had a really big, nice bike, an SN750 at this point. And I used to love going on the back of his motorbike because it was just so loud, so fast. It was just a totally different experience to the 50cc. And we were out one evening, and I was on the back of Paul's bike, and we were going way too fast, over the speed limit, around the very small <coughs> back road, and there was a mother road in the road in the track. And this was the start of a new journey for me. I'd only just left school. I'd just started a job as a car mechanic. I'd just got an apprenticeship. And I thought that was it, you know, I was set in life. We crashed on the bike. For, for me, unfortunately, I got smashed between the bike, a brick wall, and then the bike hit me on the other side of the road and it broke. The majority of my ribs punched my right lung, fractured my skull. Um, I broke my back at T4, T5, T6, which is about here. And I got what they call a spinal cord lesion. So I had a sever in the spinal cord. So that meant basically in an instant, I'd be become paralyzed from here down. Now that wasn't the end of it. When I laid on the road before the ambulance got there, I also died. So I had a cardiac arrest, which terrified my friend. He didn't know what was happening. Luckily enough, the ambulance arrived, resussed me. Then apparently, I don't remember any of this. The next day, I don't remember. My dad said when I got to the hospital, he was thrown out of the room that I was in because I had another cardiac arrest. They told the family, basically, she's so bad. hours and if she does survive the next 24 hours she's never going to work again so obviously i'm in dispute with the medical profession over that one still because i think it's still on my feet <coughs> but i'm not going to go all the way into the accident because it was a long haul it was eight eight and a half nine months in hospital and after three months i started getting movement back in my big toe on my left foot and as soon as that moved i just thought that's it i'm fine what it did do i just thought i'd be running a marathon the next week honestly that was what was in my head so for me, what it did do, though, is it started waking me up to belief systems and how powerful beliefs are when we hold on to them. Because every doctor that I came across said to me, the injuries you have state in our medical textbooks that you will never walk again. Yet the strange thing was, in my head, even though I was paralysed, I felt fine. And no one could understand this. They'd say to me, Wendy, you're going to be in a wheelchair, you can't move. And I'd go, but I'm fine. And they'd be going, but Wendy, you can't move. And I'd be like, yes, but I'm fine. You know, it was just this weird thing. Something inside of me, um, I've always been termed as stubborn by my dad. So the stubborn streak in me was just saying, no, I'll be fine. If you tell me I can't do something, then I'll do my damnedest to actually do it. 
So I came out of hospital thinking, this is all going to be all right now. I'm on crutches. I'm on my feet. I could probably only walk from here to you. So probably six, six to ten paces. And then that was it. I got home and thought, it's, I can't wait to get in my bed. I've been away from my bed for months and I just wanted to go to bed. And my bed was on the third floor in the bed. <coughs> now, my mum and dad, lovely as they are, they'd made up my sister's room for me on the first floor. And as I got into the pub, they were like, oh, we saw Helen's room out here. It'll be fine. I was like, no, I'm going to my bedroom. And I just saw them go white at that point because obviously they were thinking, how is she going to get up there? And I just thought, it's no problem. Stairs, no issue. I can do stairs. I remember walking up to the stairs, kicking one of the steps with my foot, not being able to lift my foot up and picking up. So I can't just use the other foot first. Went to lift the other foot, same thing, kicked the step and thought, right, Houston will have a problem. How are we going up the stairs? And I remember my dad, this is the first time I saw my dad cry. He still chokes me a bit now, I won't cry. Um, first time I saw him cry, he said to me, don't worry, kid, let me carry you. I'll just make it easy for you. I went, no, dad, if you do that now, I'm never going to do anything for myself. So just get out of the way, everybody, it's fine, I'll sit down. And so I thought, right, I'll just sit down and go up with my arms, which was very, uh, very interesting because both of my dogs wanted to constantly try and help me. So I had like noses in my eyes and in my ears, and it was quite funny. But my dad, my mum and dad were both actually crying the whole way up, like three flights of stairs to get to my room. Um, for me, it was just a sense of achievement to get into my bed and be able to sleep for like 24 hours in a day. So I, at that point, I realised this isn't going to be as easy as I thought it was. And I thought, how am I going to get myself back on my feet? So I just went back to the gym, said to a gym instructor, do me a favour, make it look normal. Because in my eyes, it didn't look normal. I'd lost loads of muscle tone and I felt a bit bent over. And I thought, if it looks normal, surely it'll work. No, that's not the case, apparently, as I now know. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. So I went to the gym. My sister put me back on a horse. She said the best way to get your legs working and get you some balance is to put you back on a horse. And I thought, weird logic, I've just broken my back on a bike. But she said, no, it'll do you the world of good, get you out of the fresh air. So we started that as well. And every time I got on the horse, I fell off the horse. So as soon as he moved, I just sort of went, oh, here we go. And he spun around, he laid on the floor. And if you've ever had a horse, my sister's horses are quite sarcastic, honestly. And he would just look at me and shake his head and go, it's not how you do this thing. You need to be on here. So then my sister had a great idea. She said, you know what? That's not really working at the moment, so let's do mountain biking. So she got, we got kind of full suspension mountain bikes. I didn't even know these things existed. And I thought, it looks like fun. She got me a full face crash helmet. I said to her, what do I need a crash helmet for to go mountain biking? And then she said, we're going downhill mountain biking. Because you can't pedal on the flat, we'll just go to a hill and we'll start with downhill. Because you don't need to pedal. You can learn how to balance. Again, very interesting experience. I won't bore you with the details, but it involved a lot of screaming, um, a lot of obscene words on the way down, and a lot of me falling off at the bottom because my feet were strapped in toe clips. I couldn't balance, but it was good fun. So then I just thought work-wise, what am I going to do? I'd got to that point where I was exercising so much and not really anything was changing, and I was starting to get bored. I was starting to get really depressed, and I found myself plummeting. Every now and then I'd get so depressed because I wasn't working. It didn't feel like I had any value. I was just exercising and exercising. It's like, where is this going? I need to feel like I'm giving something back somewhere. So I started doing little jobs for people that I knew that I could just do two or three hours a week. And it was actually making me worse because my body physically, I could only do a couple of hours a week. I, did, I wasn't getting any value out of it. And then, again, I started plummeting. I got really depressed. I ended up on antidepressants, which are not great, by the way, if any of you have ever taken them. Um, <clears throat> I ended up in the space where I'd had suicidal thoughts for many, many years as well, and they were getting worse and worse and worse. And I was, I was going down and down and down. And that's when I discovered board game basketball. So a friend of mine took me to a training session one night. He said, I've started playing a new sport, and I think you'd absolutely love it. Come along and have a go. So I turned up, I didn't know what I was going to, I just trusted him. I walked in and I just saw all these lads bombing about in these wheelchairs, playing basketball, I didn't even know the sport existed. So they gave me a chair, and I had a chair without what we call an anchor tip on the back. So it means that you can basically keep flipping yourself out the back of it. So I sat down and I thought, yeah, that's it. I'm good at sport, I'm fit, I can do this. Oh, this is stunky. I look like an old granny pushing along, I thought, yeah, I can see how they're doing this, and I was 
little shuffling hands on the wheelchair. Every time someone threw me a ball, I'd catch it, put my weight backwards and slip out the chair. I hadn't learned at that point how to fall properly, so I hit my head and my elbows so many times. Um, at the end of the night, we did three hours training. I got home and the thing that hurt the most was my face. I had laughed continually for three hours. I was useless at it. I couldn't push the chair. Every time I bounced the ball, it shot off around the arena. I couldn't hit a basket. Um, I could barely pass or catch because of the technicalities of what to do with your hands, hand eye coordination. I didn't realize I didn't have any at the time. But it was my face hurt so much. And I thought, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be better than I, I like targeted the player every week. <laughs> but I'm going to be better than him. And then I'm going to be better than him. And within three months, I found myself in the Great Britain women's team, which was just a random set of occurrences led me to a training session with them. And they said to me, we'd like you to join. People are mad. I don't even know the rules of this game yet. Yeah? And then within 18 months, I was at the Paralympic Games, which was even more strange for me because, again, I honestly went to the Paralympics not knowing 50% of the rules. So every time I'd get a foul, I'd be like, what? You can get away with it for so long, but then you have to know. But what happened after that was an interesting road for me because it did two things for me at the Paralympic Games. One, it made me so grateful that I actually have the ability to stand up. I have the ability to move my arms. There are some people at those games that they play sport just using their mouths. Um, I mean, I've just never seen anything like it. And the concentration, the focus, and the determination these people have. And they are so happy in life. <coughs> that literally stopped me having depression, that experience, because I got to meet so many people that were actually worse than me but had such a better attitude to life than me <coughs> and i thought wow what have i got to moan about it really did bring me right down to earth and, and make me humble and grateful and i love that and the second thing it did to me or did for me was make me realize that when you put your mind to something anything you can achieve it apart from flying to the moon with just a set of wings on. <laughs> all right so we have to have levels somewhere but you can if you what it taught me was about focus I was told if I trained hard enough, there was a slim possibility I would get selected to go to the games. So I trained 30 hours a week, every week. Some days I did not want to get out of bed. I was so tired I'd be crying. My training partner would turn up with a Costa coffee and he'd be going, come on. He'd be like tempting me out the door with a Costa coffee, you know you want this really. And I would just want to stay in bed and cry, literally. But I found something within myself that drove me to that point where I got selected and I had an experience that has led to so many other environments for me now. Another thing it did for me, it made me realise that everybody on this planet has a belief system. <coughs> the more I got to talk to all of the athletes all over the planet, the more I realised that we all had one thing in common, we didn't believe in ourselves. Now you might think that's strange because we're talking top performing Paralympians. But the more I got into their heads, the more I realised they compared themselves to other people. So one would be saying, oh, well, I'm not that good because I don't shoot like she does. Or I'm not as quick as her. Or you'd speak to someone else and you'd say, well, you know, I haven't quite got the muscles that he's got. Or, And it was really interesting because what I realised was <coughs> the whole time that you're comparing yourself to someone else, you're forgetting about you and your talents and what you're good at. And in a team, you need everybody to understand their talents. So then they can appreciate everybody else's. But I think they've got this competition tends to put like a wash through everything. So you get a bit confused. So you end up, I, I know we were made to, we were made to compete with each other for spaces. And what that did, it actually meant that people stopped noticing what they were really good at and they only started noticing their lack of something compared to someone else which generated a team environment which wasn't very supportive because no one was really giving their best because they were always feeling a bit of a lack in here compared to someone else and when i got back from the games i thought what can i do in life because i was already a basketball coach to help other people find their value find what they're great at what their talents are on the inside, so they stop comparing themselves to others, and they start actually showing what they're good at. Because I don't know if you guys have ever found this, but in this country, I was brought up with the 
don't get too big for your boots. You know, don't celebrate your victories too much and what you're too good at. But that's limiting us. You know, we're all absolutely awesome and amazing, and we have individual talents. <coughs> when you limit yourself and you put a ceiling on your head, no one gets to see what you're really good at. And in all teams, you need good defenders and you need good attackers. You need good shooters and you need good passers. And take that into your working environment now. Everybody has a strength. Are people in your team being used for their strength? NLP, um, many different therapeutic realms I've walked in and walked out of as well because I just wanted to help people get out of their labels, get out of their limitations and start appreciating each other. So that's what I now do in team environments. And I work everywhere from schools as an intervention specialist with children, all the way through to the teachers, into government institutions. I work in hostility and behavioural awareness. I work in companies like this, helping teams and individuals develop themselves so it's a more cohesive environment. But the main thing I do is I break down people's beliefs and perceptions about themselves so then they can become more happier, balanced, productive, whatever that means for you. So I'd just like you to think about how do you compare yourselves to others? Have you ever? Who in here, honestly, has ever looked at someone else and gone, I'm not as good as that? It's interesting, isn't it? How we all do it. What would happen now if we all stopped doing that and started appreciating each other for our talents? How would your work environment, your family environment, your relationships everywhere change if you just started appreciating this first, looking at everybody's individuality? Because we all judge, don't we? I say to people, everybody judges, and people no, I, I never judge anybody. Our systems are built to judge people. So what would happen if we did stop judging? When you feel yourself having a judgment or a bias against something, that you just went, actually, no, I'm just going to put that over there and see what this person in yours knows. What do you do well? How often do we ever ask anybody else, what do you think your talents are? What do you do well? And if you're ever asked that, how many of you go, oh, well, I haven't really got any, you know, I sort of hide them under the carpet and don't look at them. So I'd just like to say to you all, out of my journey, what I've learned is belief systems. Belief systems and individuality, how important they are. Whatever you believe to be true, you will perceive to be true in your environment. Thinking about that, all of our beliefs, well, I don't know, know if you know this, between 0 and 7, you're actually like mini iPods being programmed with music by everybody else around you. Seven years this happens for. Everything, everything that runs on the inside is run on this iPod. And at the age of seven, you just press play and start dancing. What music are you dancing to? Some of it's going to be really good, and you're going to be enjoying it, but some of it's going to be like fresh metal. And unless you like fresh metal, it's going to be really uncomfortable, and you're not going to know why. So start thinking about that. All the stuff that's done at an unconscious level. So I just leave you with a little learning and something to think about. You process information. We're not taught this stuff in schools, and I really wish we were. It's something that I do with children when I teach classes. We process information through our five senses at a rate, they estimate now, of around about 40 million bits per second. Your senses, by the way, it's about 21 senses, but we won't go into those. We've got some new ones. But five senses, if you can imagine 40 million bits of information coming in, you can only consciously process 134 bits per second. It's the equivalent of, if you imagine this whole room is your day, the only part of the information you can process is that red fire alarm box out of your whole day. It's not a lot of information, is it? So what are you focused on all day? Because whatever you place your focus on, you see more of in your environment. So we have a very limited, very limited attention span. If you think about the, the equivalent of this is, what do you do on a daily basis that you don't have to relearn every day? So how many of you in here know how to tie your shoelaces? <coughs> Give me a hand up, yeah? Um, if you wear, I oh, most of us have got boots and zips on, but if you wear <coughs> shoes with laces, well, how does the process work? Do you have to wake up every morning, look at your shoes, and first, firstly name your shoes, what are they? 
And then do you have to look at the places and go, how do I tie these things together? Or is it something that's just done? Just happens. How many of you make a cup of tea? This is going to sound a bit like teaching paint to dry. But how many of you make tea the right way? Which is you put the milk in last. Yes. Oh, so we've got a few that haven't been taught the right, the right way. <laughs> but if you think about that as well, when you're making a cup of tea, do you have to remember how to make the tea or do you just make it? How many of you drive to work? Use public transport, go on bikes. How much of your journey into work in the morning do you remember? Do you remember the whole of it, like the whole of this room? Or do you remember something about the size of your car and the fire button? So you might remember the odd person or the odd car. So you have so much stuff that gets programmed in and it just runs for you. So think about that with your belief systems. If you limit yourself in any way and you have any negative thinking about anything, just ask yourself, where did it come from? Is it something that's just running for me on a daily basis now that I've set as a program like tying my shoelaces that I no longer have to think of and it's not serving me? Whatever you believe to be true, you will perceive to be true in your environment. So I'd just like you all to start thinking about the good beliefs because you're going to have a lot of them in there already that are really going to serve you and how you can view everybody different and bring out in your teams and yourself your individuality <coughs> and allow yourself to perform. Stop limiting yourself with your beliefs and your thinking. Help your teammates as well to take those ceilings off and just discover more about your individual talents and how you can enhance them. So if I can leave you with anything for me, first, has been my biggest driver and inspiration to keep going forward. So my lesson in hindsight, if I was in my 20s again now, would be to find myself some value early. What do you do? Have you got things that really make you shine on the inside? And if you haven't, I would suggest you find it. <coughs> so light up your life a bit and then share that with others. So I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Um, we have got some time, have we? I was going to say thank you so much. It's a tremendously inspiring thing. We do have some time, so if you're happy, we can have some questions from the floor if anyone has any. Yeah, what would you guys like to know? Think that I can answer. I want to know what the sports where you were bad at, because I can't imagine there were any. You said at the beginning. Tennis. Oh, yeah. Tennis is historical for me. I like hitting things really hard. Now, tennis is very, saying that badminton I'm not really good at, but tennis, I tried it at school and I, no, it just didn't work. And then someone said to me, because I play wheelchair sports a lot now, why don't you try wheelchair tennis? And I thought, yeah, because I can, I'm ambidextrous, I can use both hands. Um, oh, it's just, I can't control, I, I very rarely use the word calm, because if you think I can or can't, you're right. But I honestly cannot control a tennis ball with a racket. The first time I had a lesson in my sports show, I thought, yeah, this is easy. Whack, and it just went straight out of the um, like the netted area, court area. And he was like, right, that's okay, just tilt your racket down when you hit the next one. Yeah, and it still, I tilt the racket down, it bounced and went out as well. And it was just, no, tennis, yeah. Tennis, horrendous. And bowls. I have no control over bowls, and it frustrates me. It really does. Any other questions you guys have got? About any questions, by the way, I'm going to have any questions. Don't let, go on. Um, when you, you were saying so, some people, you ask them what they're good at, and they say they want to do something. In, in practice, how, how can you try and get a person to open up and explore themselves and what they are going to do? The first thing I, I tend to do to start with is I get them to start accepting compliments just by saying the word thank you. How many people find it hard to accept a compliment? When someone goes, oh, I love, I love the scarf you've got, and they go, oh, yeah, this old thing I've got this from. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of us a lot of us will try and bury, bury anything that's um, a positive feedback. And there's a reason for this, because we, we've generated some sort of weird culture where we give negative feedback. And it develops, it just develops a pattern within people. So I teach a different form of feedback as well. So the first place I would start is just to get them to accept a compliment with a smile and a thank you. Keep it simple. So we want to start nice and simple. 
And then when I ask people, I normally do this by using a couple of children in school. So I'd say to them after we've done an exercise, what went well for you? Now normally when I ask people what went well, they normally go, well, I didn't do this right, but that's not what I've asked you. What went well for you? Oh, well, I spoke clearly. That's good. Would you say that's a talent of yours then, speaking clearly? Well, I suppose it must be. So I sort of gently, gently pull their talents out of them in a different way. It's all about language. The language you use will boost someone up or drop them down really quickly. So, I mean, forgive the word spelling. You can cast spells with every single word you utter. So language, I love linguistics and how you can use it to motivate people without them really even knowing as well. But I do that just gently, gently. But start getting, getting people to accept compliments is a large place to start. And then just ask them, what do you do well? What did you enjoy about that? It starts bringing them into that space of, oh, actually, yeah, I enjoyed the fact that I had time pressure. I coped really well with pressure. Ah, oh, so you cope well with pressure, do you? Yeah, I, I must do then, because I enjoyed that. So you can sort of gently pull things out of people. Because a, a lot of people just don't like taking compliments or saying what they're good at. And I think as well, when I talk to people in school, they say, say, if you say what you're good at, people bully you. But I always say the person that's bullying you, and they're happy on the inside. Because if they were happy on the inside, they'd probably agree with you and go, yeah, you're good at that. But if someone's got a lot of anger or not, no self-love on the inside, they tend to want to get it out of their body and give it to other people. So, yeah. So I tend to gently, gently approach it. Yes? How do you inspire students to work together? Uh, finding out their values. Very important. So, reason why they're important to people. It might be, you know, fun, trust, honesty, loyalty. These are mine, by the way. So I clearly come from my map. But if I know what mine are, and my team knows what my values are, that, and why they're important to me. So why is fun important to me? Because if people are enjoying themselves, they're learning. And I like to feel good. So now you're getting a sense of who I am in here and what drives me. Team's very important because some people, if you think about sporting environment, um, some people are there for fun, some people are there for competition. So we need to know what is important and why. So all their teammates, when this one's messing about having a laugh, their teammates won't get the hump with them because they know they, they'll work hard, but they like to have fun. And they know that this one's really, really wants a serious competition. So when they're working in this environment with this person, they can increase the competitive, even though they're having fun, so this person feels valued. The reason a lot of teams fall apart is because people feel a lack of value. Um, this helps as well. I did a, a teacher training an inset day, and I did values with two other boys. And I said, has anyone got an example of how this now helps? And these two ladies put their hand up and they went, yeah. One was a teacher, one was a TA in the same class. Haven't got on for two years, didn't know why. Just always tension there. Yeah. The reason being, the teacher has um, no OCD, and the TA <coughs> has got massive OCD. So the TA likes everything to be neat and tidy, <coughs> and she's always walking around shuffling everyone's books and putting pencils in lines. And there's always tension because the teacher's just chucking stuff. She's, you know, she's not very orderly at all. When they realised that actually one, one had a value of order and one had a value of not chaos, but basically the opposite of order, they just looked at each other and laughed. And the teacher said, right, you can now have a table in the corner, which is your table to do as much OCD on as you want. Is that okay? And then I can do what I want to do in the classroom. And that was it. From that moment on, they got on like a house on fire because they just didn't realise why there was tension. But it's because they had different values in their working environment. So for me, to help teams, the first place I start, what is important to you? That's the question I ask. What is important to you in this environment and why? And then you can just go, oh, no, I never knew that about you. I didn't know that you're actually a workaholic and you like deadlines and you like to get stuff done. And there's me wandering over there making 20 coffees a day. No wonder you're getting frustrated with me. So it takes a lot of frustration out of the workplace. Does that help? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how important is it for you on your journey to uh, kind of set goals and focus and 
kind of achievement that you can have. Yeah, goal setting is very important. Um, the reason being, it's like, I suppose it's like wanting to drive to Scotland, not knowing where you're going, and just telling, you know, just telling the sat nav to take you to Scotland and not putting any, any coordinates. You'd end up driving around the country until you randomly picked Scotland, wouldn't you? It could take you forever or it could take you two minutes. Well, not two minutes, it could stop. It could take you six hours, wouldn't it? Goals are very important. There's a reason you kind of got a bit ingrained from your reticular activating system really quickly and RAS people get there. Your RAS is what focuses that 134 bits. So it's it's something very specific. If you give it a target, find it for you. It used to focus on threats and opportunities, it still does in a way, but its main focus years and years ago was, is it gonna eat me or eat it? So if something was coming down the road, it would instantly alert you to run or chase it, because it was threats and opportunities. But now, we shop at Tesco's and we don't want to have wild animals chasing stuff down the road, because we're not here anyway. So it's changed its focus. But you can give it direct instructions to find a path for you. So I tend to map most things out. I always start from the end and backtrack as well. So I like reverse engineer all my maps. So <coughs> what's my main goal? And then I backtrack to where I am now. And then I set daily goals, weekly goals, monthly goals. And my yearly goals are always changing. But at least I have a target up here. If you don't target, it's a, it is a bit like just sailing the boat out into the ocean going, I want to go to Jamaica. Tell it go. And just heading off in a direction, hoping you're going to get to Malta. So very important to set goals if you want to achieve them. I think there was a study done in Harvard year, about 20 years ago, and they studied people who wrote down their goals and didn't. And there was there's only about 100 people that they did the study on. Five people wrote down every day what they wanted to achieve, and the rest didn't bother. The five people that wrote down everything they wanted to achieve, they achieved it and more. Everybody else sort of stayed low to mediocre in their working environment. So there's a lot of there is a lot of scientific study around goal setting, but physically writing stuff down, it activates the RAS even more. So yeah, it's definitely worth doing. I can change my goals really quickly. Okay. So what I've been doing from that is evaluating There is so much that you said that is so concentrated and so insightful that what I'm going to do is I'll take everything off this and I'll zoom in and tell you every single piece of what, again, I saw you did the same thing again. So I'd just like to ask you all to say thank you very much today.
Thank you.